We have all asked ourselves at some point whether we are alone in the universe. Is anybody else out there? What is this all about? These are the most profound questions that we can ask ourselves. And as a species, humans have been asking these questions since the dawn of consciousness. These are the questions that drove me to become a planetary scientist. These are the questions that still get me out of bed every morning to do the work that I do studying the planet Mars, working with NASA's active Mars rover missions. I believe that if we are serious about the question of life in the universe, then we have to be serious about exploring Mars. Mars is our nearest neighbor planet and perhaps the best candidate for another world where life could have emerged beyond life on Earth. I don't think it's likely that there is life on Mars today, especially not on the surface. Mars is a harsh, cold, barren, desert wasteland. There's no liquid water on the surface. The atmosphere is too thin. There's no magnetic field protecting the surface from harsh, life-destroying radiation. But we know that Mars was a different place several billion years ago. Mars might have been a world that looked more like this. We know that there was abundant water on Mars. And we know this from the scars that are carved in the surface of Mars of ancient rivers, flowing water, ponding in deep craters. Now, we don't think that these conditions on Mars would have lasted long enough for any life to evolve into intelligent life, let alone animal life. We think that if life ever emerged on Mars, it would be the most primitive, simple forms of microorganisms. But still, even if primitive life emerged on Mars, our nearest neighbor planet, doesn't that make it more likely that primitive life could be emerging on planets around stars throughout the universe? And if primitive life is more likely throughout the universe, doesn't it make it more possible that at least one planet has evolved life similar to us, intelligent life that maybe someday we could talk to? This is why Mars is so important. Now, our Mars rovers have been starting to get at these questions of could there have been life ever on the red planet? The Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, were two identical twin robots sent to Mars in 2004, and they have been actively exploring the planet. The Opportunity rover is still going today. These rovers have found evidence for abundant water that has interacted with the rocks here in the past. We have found evident, evidence for hydrothermal systems on Mars and ancient lakes. The Mars Science Laboratory rover, Curiosity, has been exploring Mars since 2012. Curiosity has found evidence for ancient lakes that were once filled with fresh water. That's water that's good enough to drink. Water that's not too salty, not too acidic, exactly the kind of water that life could thrive in. Curiosity has also found evidence for organic molecules preserved in the ancient Martian rocks. Organic molecules are the building blocks of life. So Curiosity has provided the first definitive evidence that Mars was once a habitable place. Now, even though these rovers are making tremendous strides in our understanding of the planet Mars, they cannot directly answer that question, was there ever life on Mars? To answer that question, we need to do more. We need to bring samples from the surface of Mars back here to Earth. We need to do more sophisticated and complex analyses with those samples than can be done remotely on the surface of another planet. We need to bring rocks from Mars back to Earth so that we can do the kinds of complex analyses that will identify potential biosignatures in rocks. Those are the fingerprints of life. We need to bring Mars back to Earth so that we can keep pace with technology. Even though the Curiosity rover has the most sophisticated instruments ever sent to Mars, they're already out of date. They were designed more than 10 years ago now. We need the rocks here to keep pace with the newest technology. 
We also need them here so we can establish repeatability. In science, an observation is really only valid if it can be repeated by multiple observers. Now, imagine Curiosity were to detect a chemical compound in a rock that we knew was a biosignature, a chemical compound that could only form naturally through microorganisms. How would we know that that was a real detection of ancient life on Mars? How would we know that Curiosity's instruments hadn't malfunctioned? were giving us a false reading? How would we know that they just weren't calibrated correctly? We need samples from Mars here on Earth so that we can establish repeatability. Carl Sagan said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Life on Mars would be an extraordinary claim. We need repeatability here on Earth to establish that extraordinary evidence. Now, even if you don't care about life on Mars, even if you're a skeptic and think it was never possible that life emerged on another planet, there are still compelling reasons to bring samples of the Martian surface back here to Earth to study. There are clues about the formation of the solar system written in the rocks from Mars. We would be able to tell the ages of different surfaces on Mars. We would be able to answer questions about how Mars lost its water and whether the Earth maybe might suffer the same fate. Now, nature has delivered several rocks from Mars to Earth for free. Every once in a while, there's a giant impact on the planet Mars that flings fragments of rocks from the surface of Mars into space. Eventually, some of those rock fragments land here on Earth, and we're able to identify them as being from Mars because they contain the fingerprint of the Martian atmosphere in teeny gas bubbles. This meteorite in particular we know is from Mars, Allen Hills 84001, and it was a very exciting find because there were structures inside this rock that some scientists argue could be microfossils, ancient life forms preserved in the rock. Now, this, stru this structure is a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair, and it's very controversial. <coughs> it's not well accepted that this is evidence for life in an ancient Mars rock. But knowing that samples from the Martian surface can travel through space, rocks can travel between Mars and the Earth, makes the question of life on Mars all the more important. It makes panspermia possible. Panspermia is the idea that life might have once emerged on Mars before it ever evolved on Earth, and that early Martian life forms could have traveled to the Earth long ago in these meteorites, essentially seeding this planet with Martian life. So maybe we are all the Martians that we've been looking for. <laughs> But there's still a problem with these natural samples we get back from Mars for free. We don't know where on the surface any of these came from. We do know that they've been traveling through space exposed to extreme radiation conditions, harsh temperature fluctuations. We've had no control over these samples. If we really want to answer the questions of whether life could have evolved on Mars, whether there is evidence for life in the Martian rocks, we need to go there and bring the rocks back ourselves. We need that context. So why haven't we done this yet? This is not a new idea. NASA has been thinking about doing a sample return mission to Mars since the 1970s. Why haven't we done it yet? And the reason is, Mars is hard. There have been 15 attempts to land, to land, not even bring things back, just to land on the surface of Mars by the United States, the former Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom. Of those 15 attempts, only eight have been successful. That is not much better than a 50% success rate. Mars is hard. And in order to bring samples from Mars back to Earth, not only do you have to land there gently and safely, you have to collect the samples, launch them out of Mars's gravity, and send them all the way back to Earth for a safe landing again here on Earth. Now, in our current budget situation, we can't do all of that in a single mission. And the way we envision that happening is in a three-stage process. First of all, send a rover to Mars, land it safely and gently, 
and collect the samples that you want to bring back to Earth. Stage two would be a second rover going to the same place, collecting those samples into a sample cache, a fancy bucket, launching that bucket out of Mars gravity into orbit around Mars. Then stage three would arrive in Mars orbit, rendezvous with that sample bucket, bring it all the way back to Earth, and hopefully land safely here on Earth, a little softer than the Genesis spacecraft did. <laughs> Every step of this process is extremely difficult. The good news is that we have the first stage of this mission funded. NASA is starting to build the first stage rover that will go to Mars, identify the most interesting samples, and start collecting them, hopefully for the eventual return to Earth. Now, this rover um, is going to land on Mars in the year, it's going to launch to Mars in the year 2020. It's so new, it doesn't even have a name. We just call it Mars 2020. I'm part of the camera team that is designing and building now the two powerful zoom lenses, color imagers, that are going to be on the top of this rover. Now, this rover is going to be on Mars for at least two years, collecting a couple dozen samples from the surface over a distance of at least 10 kilometers, or about six miles. So the big question right now is where on Mars we are going to land. Where are we going to collect those samples? This is incredibly important, because if we go to the wrong place that doesn't have the kind of samples that we want, we don't know when, if ever, we'll get another chance to do this. To give you an idea of just how hard of a problem this is, imagine you're part of an alien species who's been watching Earth for a while now, know that the planet is interesting, and you finally get your one chance to send a spacecraft to the Earth that is going to collect the first samples to be brought back to your alien planet. Where on the Earth would you go to do that over a distance of about six miles? Where on the Earth could you collect a couple dozen rocks over six miles that are going to tell you <coughs> as much as possible about the entire history of the Earth and everything that has ever lived on the Earth. Where would you go? You'd have to be able to land safely. On Mars, we can't land anywhere that's too high. The air is too thin. We can't land anywhere that's too low. The winds are too strong. We have to land near the equator. We have to land someplace flat and smooth. So where would you go on the Earth to do that? You might immediately think of the Grand Canyon. There's a huge stack of Earth history recorded in those rocks. But I'd tell you the top of the canyon is not safe to land on, and the bottom is too windy. You can't go there. And then what if you went to a place like the Sahara Desert, not really knowing what was there, and all you would do was collect sand? How much of the Earth and everything that has happened on this planet would you just never know? That's why this is such a hard and important problem. My students and I are going to be giving input into NASA about this landing site process. There are currently 37 candidate sites on the table, and we are going to be studying and analyzing the science values of several of these. Will this rover go to Marth Vallis, where some of the oldest rocks on the surface of Mars are preserved? Or will it land at the Eberswalde Delta, where an ancient river flowed into a deep and quiet lake? Or will this rover go back to the site of the Spirit rover, where Spirit found evidence for an ancient hydrothermal system. Lots of water interacting with the rocks, lots of energy. Good potential for preserving evidence of past life. And just imagine that the selfie the two rovers could take <laughs> together at this site. So the question of where to land on Mars and if there was life on Mars is incredibly important. And if this is at all interesting to you, if you care at all about the samples we're going to get back from Mars someday, then I invite you to follow along on this process. Mars exploration is not a secretive, closed process. You can all go onto NASA's website and follow the landing site selection process as it's happening. You can watch a live stream of the debates that happen at these landing site workshops. And if you're interested in what's going on with the Mars rovers, you can go online and see the new images as they come down every day. 
you, I do not get to see most of the images from the Mars rovers any sooner than you do. They are all available online. You can flip through them with your morning coffee, just like you would your morning paper. Now, the question of life on Mars is one of the biggest that we can ask. And if we do find evidence that there ever was any form of life whatsoever on Mars, that will not be NASA's discovery. That will not be the discovery of scientists like me. That will be all of our discovery. So let's get out there and let's bring Mars to Earth. Thank you.